My name is Scott Nye, and this is Talking Radical Radio. Hello and welcome to Talking Radical Radio, where we bring you grassroots voices from across Canada. We give you the chance to hear many different people who are facing many different struggles, talk about what they're doing, how they're doing it, and why they're doing it, in the belief that such listening is a crucial step in strengthening all of our efforts to change the world. On this week's show, I'll be speaking with Patty Crowick and Carl Dockstader. The land upon which cities are built is no less indigenous land than any other territory in what is now called Canada. Yet in the dominant culture, most towns and cities are intensely coded as settler spaces, and in more varied and complicated ways as white or white-dominated spaces. And living as an urban indigenous person often comes along with a particular set of experiences around disconnection, erasure, tokenization, and marginalization. As today's guests describe, however, it also often involves quite distinct experiences of community, grassroots resurgence, and thriving. Patty Crowick is an Anishinaabe woman with roots in Laxul First Nation in Northern Ontario. Carl Dockstader is an Oneida man of the Bear Clan, and his family is from the Oneida Nation of the Thames. Both of them grew up and live in the Niagara region in Southern Ontario. Though Crowick was largely disconnected from other Indigenous people earlier in her life, while Dockstader was part of urban Indigenous spaces from a young age, both were drawn into more active forms of participation in community through the Idle No More movement that began in late 2012. Both were pulled initially into the activism that constituted that movement, but soon enough focused their energies on a range of long-term community building, educational, and other grassroots activities. Much of their grassroots work is very focused on the urban indigenous community in Niagara itself. They have, for example, worked on local rallies in Niagara in response to national issues, like missing and murdered indigenous women, and the acquittal of the white farmer who murdered Cree teen Colton Bushy. Both of them are also involved in the Friendship Center in Fort Erie, Doc Stater as a court worker, and Crowick as a member of its board. And for those not familiar, friendship centers are community organizations in many cities and towns that are run by and for indigenous people, often providing services, but also often acting as spaces or hubs for various other kinds of community activities as well. Crowick is also involved in the women's hand drum group that is organized through the friendship center. Though the group began mostly just as a place for women to regularly get together, it has become an important source of grassroots leadership a way for women to connect with culture and tradition, a way in which members become empowered to be more vocal and active, and a collective voice that carries weight and helps build other kinds of initiatives in the community. As well, both of them have been active in building community and education that reaches a little farther afield. That has included participating in an effort to establish a broad-based anti-racism coalition that was based in Niagara but included a wide range of communities, groups, and organizations, it also includes, for both of them, turning to digital tools like podcasting. For Crowick, it also involves making connections with and offering concrete solidarity to indigenous communities elsewhere in the country. She has put together a Patreon-based crowdfunding initiative called Pay Your Rent that offers settlers who live on the occupied land of indigenous people, which is to say all of us, a way to give back. So far, the money raised has been used to do things like send menstrual supplies to communities in Nunavut and in northern Manitoba, and to support Mi'kmaq water defenders opposing Alton Gas in Nova Scotia. And as the fundraiser grows, it will support more communities in ways identified by the communities themselves. According to Crawick and Doc Stater, building community in urban indigenous contexts can be challenging because people come from so many different nations and have such a wide range of relationships to indigeneity. But they also see this as a source of strength. Many different people, with many different ways of work, all working towards common goals. I speak with Crawick and Doc Stater about the breadth of grassroots work that happens in urban indigenous contexts, and particularly about their work in Niagara. Anine, I'm Patty Crowick, and I live in the Niagara region. My father is Roy Wesley, and we are from originally the Laxul First Nation, way up north of Thunder Bay. I live here in Niagara with my husband and our dog. 
I grew up in Niagara. My mom had moved us from the Sioux Lookout area down to Niagara where her family is. And so I was raised in her German-Ukrainian family. And I did not know that there were any Indigenous people down here in Niagara. I thought I was the only one and that they all lived way up north or out west somewhere in teepees. And then when we moved to Toronto as an adult, I connected with the Toronto Friendship Centre there. And then through jobs, we moved back to St. Catharines and again had no idea that there were Indigenous people down here until I got into social work and I realized that there was a Friendship Centre down here. So since then, I have found the Indigenous community largely through the Friendship Centre, but as a child, I had no idea. Sigali, my name is Carl Lockstader. I'm Oneida Bear Clan. Our family is from Oneida of the Thames with roots that trace all the way back to New York, but really we're Fort Erieans at heart and we live here in the one dish, one spoon territory. I've been very fortunate to grow up around the Friendship Center movement and I consider myself to be firmly entrenched in the urban indigenous movement. I'm very fortunate because since I was born, I've always been aware of my indigenous identity, so that's really grown a lot lately. There really are a wide variety of types of Indigenous people, especially here in an urban setting. Like we have 60 scoop people. We have people like myself that have roots that go back to the Longhouse. We have big drummers and Anishinaabe people. I'm trying to think of where I actually met Patty. It would have to be Idle No More. I think we were both involved with, there was a big push in our area to raise awareness around missing and murdered Indigenous women. Since then, for me anyways, there's been this shift over to the Friendship Center movement and over to community building from activism, but they're never that far apart because as much as I'm thoroughly urban Indigenous and as much as I consider that to be a part of my identity, it's still sort of an abnormal place to live in a mainstream Western society. Indigenous people are still seen as being different or the other, and I can never not be aware of that. As urban Indigenous people, we live mostly in white communities, and it's impossible not to internalize that view of ourselves. You know, we go to powwows, but there's an artificial aspect to them, too. Unless you actually live there, you're still a visitor. So that's where the Friendship Center creates that space. And yeah, I think it really was during Idle No More that we met. When I think of Idle No More, I think of when birds are getting ready to migrate and how they keep swooping down. And every time they swoop down, this flock gets bigger and bigger. And when I think of Idle No More, I think of that, like that's the winter we danced, right? And all those round dances kept gathering in more and more people. And so for me, it was that activism around Idle No More that pulled me in and people got familiar. And I was quite literally dancing on the edges of the Indigenous community when I was invited by another friend to sit on the board of the Friendship Center. And that just really threw me into the administrative organizing piece of what it is to build a community of very varied Indigenous people. I mean, we've got Cree, Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, we've got Choctaw, we've got people from all over the place with different creation stories, different worldviews, different understandings of our place. And yet we're trying to build community together. And that can create, you know, some differences, but it also brings an incredible strength. I think there's tremendous power in the differences that we bring to each other if we can harness those differences in a way that moves Indigenous people forward. Talk more about the Friendship Centre. The Friendship Centre movement is something that's supposed to reflect the will of the community. I thought they did a good job making space for people to exist in the Friendship Centre while still acknowledging that, I mean, they accept government funding. So it's a fine line to walk, but particularly with the leadership we have in our local Friendship Centre movement here, I thought they did a really wonderful job walking that fine line between saying, okay, yes, we want to provide social services, we want to help out families, we do need to do certain things to keep in line with our friends and partners over in the government. But at the end of the day, if the youth group wants to make a space and have a 24-hour drum to raise awareness to environmental issues like they did at the Fort United Friendship Center on Earth Day, then that's our job, too, to find a way to make that fit with the movement. Currently, I'm the court worker for the Fort United Friendship Center. Coming from an activist background, I'm very familiar with systemic racism. I'm very familiar with the statistics. I mean, we represent around 1 in 20 of the population. But Indigenous people make up, depending on whether it's federal or provincial, between a fifth or a quarter of the prison population. So to really see it firsthand, to see our people overrepresented, to see the over-incarceration firsthand, to have racism go from the pages of the blogs and from the markers on the signs, to really see it in the justice system, it, it tells me that we have a long way to go. I've sat on the board. 
were part of a lot of the administrative discussions around the Friendship Center, around looking for funding sources, making sure that the lights stay on and the roof is whole, and that those things that Carl is talking about can take place, because if the lights aren't on and the roof isn't whole, then there isn't space to do those things. We've just recently broken ground on expanding the daycare, bringing Aboriginal Head Start which are two really key programs that Friendship Centers have providing care for children. That program is really cool because it nests children right in the midst of their culture. Lately, I've been thinking a lot about the Anishinaabeg flood story. In the short version, Nanda Bush and the animals find themselves floating on a log. He tells them if he can get some dirt from the bottom, he can rebuild. One by one, they try and fail. Eventually, Muskrat makes the attempt and he succeeds. Nanabush takes the dirt, puts it onto the log, and sings while the animals dance. As they dance, the land grows and becomes Turtle Island. And I think about my work at, because I am sit on the board, so my work at the Friendship Center, but also my participation in the Friendship Center, because I also participate in a women's hand drum group. I think of both of those things as reaching backwards into our traditions, reaching backwards into what elders have to say, backwards into songs and ways of understanding and then bringing that forward and dancing something new into being. People often have this idea that as Indigenous people, we want to go back to the way things were. We want to reset the clock to 1490 as if we somehow got stuck in evolution. That is just so far from the truth. I mean, there's knowledge and life that's specific to this space, but we have always adapted, you know, new technologies and trading partners and things like that. And so for me, building community in friendship centers is constantly reaching back into that knowledge. And I have watched the Fort Erie Center create that space to bring in elders. So we're constantly reaching back for that handful of dirt and then bringing it forward and doing something new with it. And over the last five or six years that I've been very directly involved in the Friendship Center, I have seen so many people picking up that handful of dirt and just moving it forward into beautiful things. I'm also a member of the Hand Drum Group, which just started as a place for women to get together. And it's evolved into this ongoing group that meets every Wednesday night. Just to go back to that flood story, everybody who comes through has picked up that handful of dirt. We not only learn the songs, we learn where the songs came from. We learn the stories. Some of these songs have very significant stories. So we're learning about who we are in this drum group. And something that a lot of women who have joined this drum group have talked about is finding their voice in terms of not just singing and being willing to sing in public spaces. We're also starting to speak out and find our voice in terms of advocating for ourselves and advocating for others. Through this drum group, I can map my own trajectory in terms of that and speaking out at rallies and organizing. I wouldn't have had the feet or the voice to do that if it wasn't for this drum group. And I'm not the only person that has followed that trajectory. And it's really exciting to see the work that happens in women's lives when we give them the space and the tools and that little handful of dirt that they can carry forward. And we get paid when we go and we sing like at the Celebration of Nations or, at you know, we, we've sung at different events and they pay us what they can. We don't know what to do with this money. So we just go and we put it in the bank because we don't really have any costs associated with what we do. But what we have been able to do with that money, we have then turned around and used it to build community. We've had fundraisers two years now to raise money for some local lacrosse teams. Lacrosse is a very important game, particularly for the Haudenosaunee people. So we've had fundraisers to use our money to seed fundraisers for those kids. We've used that money to seed fundraisers for a family that was going through a really hard time. So this money from the community that comes from our drumming and singing, which is something that builds us and nurtures us and nurtures our relationships. We've got children kind of running around while we sing, which is part of building them up. But also the money that comes from the community flows through us. And then we have been able to help and nurture community events and community things. What do you see as the strengths, but also the challenges of building community in this way that involves people who come from many different nations and who relate in very different ways to their indigenous experiences and identities. That's the trick right there is you have a lot of people starting at a lot of different points, which can be problematic at times. But on the other hand, we're very fortunate that we're rich with some people that have a deep traditional knowledge. And when you get back to the foundational roots of a lot of the knowledge, 
like when I think of our ways and when I think of our great law teachings and the ways of the Haudenosaunee, I've always been taught that those roots, the roots of the great tree of peace are meant to spread and that the shelter of protection that you get from the way of peace, that everyone's entitled to some of that protection. So those are the types of teachings and philosophies that have helped us become more cohesive as a community. So as different as we are, having a strong grounding in tradition is the thing that's bound us together ultimately. And uh, the Nishnabeg, we talk about the eighth fire, which a lot of people believe is the time that we're in or moving towards right now. And in the Great Fire, we also talk about a similar type of gathering. We talk about a path that people need to choose. And so both of those things are very welcoming in terms of you don't have to be Nishnabeg to join with us. You don't have to be Haudenosaunee to be sheltered by that tree. And where the friction happens, we talk about it. We work through it. We can work together on common goals, and we can be okay with relationships ending when they have other things that they need to work on, but we know that we can support each other in those things without having to be doing the same thing and without having to do it in the same way. Like I'm very big picture. I tend to think very big, overarching, systemic, structural, and I have friends who think very one-to-one and local politics and dealing with stuff. and. Both of those things work together very well. Both of those things are important, and remembering that and knowing that is really important and critical in all these different nations working together. We don't have to be doing the same thing in order to be moving in the same direction. You've also been involved in coalition building work beyond the urban indigenous community, working with other communities and groups in opposing racism in Niagara. Talk a little bit about that work of building those broader coalitions. I think it had to be done. There was an anti-racism coalition that started as a reaction largely to Trumpism, for lack of a better term. And once you turn over the rock of racism, you realize that it runs deep. But whether it's faith groups or the Friendship Center movement or labor, there is a healthy appetite to actively do something to really further anti-racism. My entry to the Anti-Racism Coalition came after the memorial for the mosque bombing that happened in Quebec a couple of years ago. And then I spoke at the one-year anniversary of that as an Indigenous person and these actions really taking place on Indigenous space and that that's not okay. We welcome settlers and newcomers and make treaty and build relationships. And I think building relationships is something that Indigenous people have always done. We've built relationships with each other, whether it was formal treaties or just trade arrangements or things like that. And then when the newcomers came, we just continued to build relationships. So for me, being part of an anti-racism coalition was important, but I keep looking to broaden that circle to involve labor, to involve, you know, disability activism, to involve the LGBTQ community and two-spirited people. I'm really looking forward to later this fall building a broad-based coalition of which anti-racism is certainly part, but not the only focus, because these things are all just so interconnected that there's no way to do the work in one area without also impacting other areas. So it's important that we have all of those voices at the table so that we can work together. That seems to me like it's maybe connected to the work that both of you do on different podcasting and radio projects. Talk a little bit about each of your programs, but also about why you see that work as an important part of community building and challenging structural issues in your area. I think the way the Medicine for the Resistance and One Dish, One Mic contrast really shows how broad of a range of Indigenous voices there can be and voices of different people. For our show, when Sean Vandercliff and myself started One Dish, One Mic, what we were looking at was a very Niagara-specific focus on the balance between Haudenosaunee perspectives and Anishinaabe perspectives. And I think we've done a good job fleshing that out over almost 30 episodes. But it definitely has a local focus. We do find that things like the Colton Bushy verdict are obviously going to affect us here in Niagara. And so it's important to take a look at those national issues and how they affect us on a local level. But also that in the space that we've carved out for ourselves, there's still space for other perspectives. And I find myself listening to medicine for the resistance and realizing that there are important other perspectives that need to have their own space too. Medicine for the resistance got started kind of by accident. My co-host is Carrie Goring, and she's a black woman raising her grandchildren. 
I had gone to a conference a couple of years ago, the Decolonizing Conference up at OISE in Toronto. I do social work and I got challenged to talk to my clients about race because it's not a secret to them. They know that they're black. They know, you know, that they're Muslim. They know that they're East Indian. They know who they are. But we, as social workers, don't talk about it and we need to. So I started talking with Carrie about what it was like to, you know, be a black woman and live in the suburbs of St. Catharines and have these little beautiful black children going to this beautiful white little school. And all of our conversations wound up going sideways into race and how we built resilience into our children. This podcast just kind of happened out of that. So we are looking at all kinds of topics through this Indigenous lens of the Black experience and the Indigenous experience. One reviewer actually called it unapologetic Black and Native womanism, which just, I had the biggest smile on my face when I read that. And a lot of our conversations recently have centered around futurism. We've talked with a number of different authors and educators because Indigenous and Black people have come through the apocalypse. Like, you know, white dystopias are all about things that have already happened to Black and Indigenous people. All of these things we've already experienced. So where do we go now? How do we imagine this beautiful new world? And so we're talking a lot lately about this new world and how do we imagine something new and different. So that's been the focus of a lot of our recent conversations. The name came from, you know, African cultures and indigenous cultures share this idea of medicine. So those people on the front lines getting water cannoned, they need some medicine. And so that's what we're seeking to provide is encouragement and medicine for people who know that they're not alone in the fight because being an urban indigenous person can be very lonely. And so these podcasts, we've always had oral traditions. This is just an evolution of the oral tradition. And another manifestation of this work to build relationships and build community that I know you're involved in, Patty, is work that's building relationships with people in remote and northern communities through the Pay Your Rent fundraiser. How did that come about? So this past June, my husband and our youngest son and I traveled up to Akaluit to visit our son, Max, who is working up there. For a long time, I've been aware of a breakfast program, and I contribute to it. Michael Murphy relies on Amazon because Amazon Prime ships free to Akaluit. So I, I've donated to that. So when we were traveling up there, I contacted him to say, hey, I'm going to have an extra suitcase. What do you want me to bring? So he talked to the teachers, and they had told him that they wanted menstrual supplies because these products are very expensive in the North. They are not covered by the Nutrition North subsidy, and he had been told the girls were missing class over this. These items aren't cheap in Ontario either. So I put a word on Twitter that I was looking for help, and I really hoped to break $100. But by the time all the donations were counted, I had gotten over 2000 Wound up filling four hockey bags with sanitary supplies, backpacks, clothing, and Amazon gift cards as well, because we quite literally ran out of space. Many of the people who had donated wanted to know if they could contribute in an ongoing way, because, of course, four hockey bags is not going to resolve the issue of expensive sanitary supplies in the northern, what's currently known as Canada. So they wanted to know if they could contribute in a more ongoing way. I had given some thought to a Patreon account, but hadn't really done anything. And then one day I got involved in a conversation on Twitter about settlers and colonialism, and I made a snippy remark to somebody that if they felt so bad about living on occupied land, they should pay some rent. And bam, got the idea for my Patreon fundraiser, raced over to Patreon to make sure that name wasn't taken yet. And so now if you search pay your rent on Patreon, you will find varying levels of support from alleviating your colonial guilt at $1 a month up to accomplice level support of $25 a month. I very quickly achieved my first goal, uh, one hockey bag per month to a Kalui. Now I have a second goal with Hilda Anderson Pierce, which started during a Facebook exchange on Rosanna Deerchild's page. Hilda was commenting on the scarcity of these items in northern Manitoba. I told her about my project. We've now achieved that second goal, which is a hockey bag, which she will get from Winnipeg to northern Manitoba. And what I'm really hoping is, like Nicole, for example, has taken that $200 a month that she gets, and she turned it into two hockey bags for the month of September. So it's becoming seed money, and it's creating a network that now Nicole can run with. That's brilliant. And I've just put out a third goal with Sadie Beaton from Halifax, which shifts pay your rent a little bit, because really pay your rent is about encouraging settlers of all stripes to pay their rent to help Indigenous communities with what Indigenous communities need. So what I was told was needed in northern Manitoba and in Iqaluit is sanitary supplies. With Sadie Beaton, what that community is identifying is support for water action. 
Alton Gas wants to use salt caves to store natural gas, and the Mi'kmaq people are proposing that. So we have a monthly goal now of an additional $500 to go to those water defenders out in Mi'kmaq. So it's, it's very exciting, and seeing the support is exciting, and it's just kind of a fun, tongue-in-cheek way to raise some money, but people are living on occupied Indigenous land, and they need to pay some rent. What would you like to be seeing grow and develop in Niagara in the next few years? We get tokenized inclusion. We get brought out on, you know, Orange Shirt Day. We get brought out on Indigenous Peoples Day. We get brought out and we're given this little space where we can talk. I'm thinking, you know, like within the social work field, within education, within the court system. But we're not given that kind of broad structural space where we could transform education. We could transform the classroom. We'll get trotted out for special occasions and groundbreakings. And and that's not a knock on anybody who participates in those types of things, because I think that anywhere where we can include indigeneity in a space is important. But it's always on the settler terms. It's always on the white Western society's terms, what level of involvement that we'll have. And that's tough because we've always been here. We've been very courteous. We've been very constructive in the way that we've conducted our relationships. And still, in spite of that, it's like we're at a lot of times as an afterthought. Oh, yeah, by the way, oh, we need to include an Indigenous perspective or, oh, crap, we should find out what they have to say. And that that's not right. And part of building capacity and building community is giving strength to people's voices so that when we're tokenized in that way, we can take advantage of being tokenized. We want the space, but we also have to be willing to take it when we're given these opportunities and use them on our terms, that not everything has to be on settler terms. I wouldn't have had the strength to use my voice in that way when I was being tokenized if I didn't have that space that the Friendship Center and the Hand Drum Group have given us to build ourselves and, you know, to give us that little hand of dirt that we can carry forward with us. You have been listening to my interview with Patty Crowick and Carl Dockstader. They've talked about a lot of different kinds of grassroots work in this episode, but to find out more about some of it, search online for the Fort Erie Native Friendship Center, for the Medicine for the Resistance and One Dish One Mike podcasts, and for the Pay Your Rent fundraiser on Patreon. To find out more about Talking Radical Radio, the guests, the theme music, and the ways that you can listen, go to talkingradical.ca and click on the link for the radio show. On the site, you can sign up for email updates or follow us on Facebook, Twitter, iTunes, SoundCloud, and other platforms. I'm Scott Nye, a writer and media producer based in Hamilton, Ontario, and the author of two books of Canadian history told through the stories of activists published by Fernwood Publishing. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope you tune in again next week. <laughs>